Hello again, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. We've been going through the Bible verse by verse, as I have been doing for over 30 years. This is my fourth series in the past 30 plus years going through the Bible. And uh, we currently are in the New Testament book of Philippians. We're in Philippians chapter 3, and we pick up our study in verse 15. So, Grab your Bible, open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, and we will begin there in a minute. While you're getting your Bible, I'll take a moment, as I always do, to remind you of the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And what makes this website so unique is that it's all Bible, and it's all Bible taught verse by verse. Three complete series going through the Bible. Like I said, I'm on series number four from Genesis through Revelation. And this is not a survey. This is not a chapter by chapter or even a paragraph by paragraph. But this is a verse by verse study. That's why it's taken so long. But the Word of God is the most important thing in the world. It's worth the effort to teach it. It's worth the effort to study it. And I'm glad that you're able to join me today as we study in the book of Philippians. And one more time, I don't remember if I gave you that uh, web address for Scripture Verse by Verse website, but it's found at thebibleversebyverse.com. That's thebibleversebyverse.com. Well, let's uh, pray and get into Philippians. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Philippians chapter 3, verse 15. This is one of my favorite verses. I just love the authority of the Word of God. And I love, you know what I love about teaching the Word of God without fear of what man may think, how they may respond? I can't even go there in my mind, and, and I don't want to. Just teach the Word of God clearly with authority. And those who accept it, accept it, and those who don't, don't. But just remember this, the Word of God is not on trial. You are, and I am. The Word of God is true. It is the Word of God, without error. It's not on trial. We are, and how we respond to it, whether we accept it or reject it, whether we live it or deny it in our actions, That determines whether we are guilty or innocent concerning our relationship to the Word of God. So, because the Word of God is so true, I can speak it with authority. I remember when I was in uh, college, it was a secular college down in Madison, Wisconsin, years and years ago, this is before I was saved, there was a professor, and I remember one day he He talked. He lectured for like 45 minutes, and I sat there, and I listened as carefully as I possibly could. And after lecturing for 45 minutes, his final words concerning everything that he said were these. I think. I think. He just talked for 45 minutes, and he ended that lecture by saying, I think. And I remember I slammed my pencil down on my desk and I thought, what am I doing here? And I wasn't even saved. I want truth. Truth that can be spoken with authority. And the Word of God should be and and must be spoken with authority. So Paul says in verse 15, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal it, reveal this even unto you. So, If you don't get certain truths about the Bible, about God, about Jesus, if you're not, if if they're not clicking with you, as much as they are with, say, more mature Christians, don't worry about it. It'll happen. You know, it'll happen. Sometimes things take time to come to pass, and God will eventually make truths clear to you if you have a heart for Christ and you stay close to him just be patient be patient with yourself be patient with others because we're all at different levels and just stay in the word verse 16 nevertheless 
As to that which we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. And, and this is what I was talking about earlier. The authority of God's word. Live up to what you know. Don't worry about what you don't know. Focus on living by the truth that you do know. And you know what's going to happen? God will give you more truth in the process. The more you live the truth, the more truth God will give you. And so a big part of growing in our knowledge of God includes living for God today and doing right right where we are. Verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them who walk, even as ye have us, for an example. How about that for authority? The authority of God's word. Be followers of me. Do what I do. You know why Paul could be so adamant about that? I mean, that, took, that takes a lot of guts, right? Hey, you follow me and you'll be okay. You do what I do. You behave the way I behave and you'll be okay. The reason he could say that with such authority is that he believed in the authority of God's word and he knew full well that he was living the word of God himself. That's confidence. And you see, to be, to be an effective spiritual leader, you have to live out the message that you teach. I'll never forget a pastor that I had way, way back, a long time ago, when I was first starting out teaching the Word of God. <laughs> and, and I found out that he was quite typical of many modern evangelical pastors. I'll never forget it because we were in a midweek Bible study. And I don't know what we were talking about, talking about getting up early and spending time in the Word. And I've shared this in the past, but it fits. And I'll never forget. He said, well, I'll just be honest. I don't get up early enough to study the Word of God and read and pray. I just, I'm just being honest with you. I'm, I'm just being open. I, I like to stay in bed till 8, 8.30. And so I just don't get up in time. I, I know I should, but I don't, and I'm just being honest. And I'll never forget the women who were there just fawning over him. And some of the men, too, I'm sad to say. Good Lord, isn't he wonderful? Isn't he just something? He is so real. And I was thinking to myself, I'm totally disgusted with you, mister. You're supposed to be a spiritual leader. You teach, and then you look for, you look, you look for adoration because of your false humility. You miserable wretch. Get serious about the word of God or quit teaching it. Paul would never have said anything like that because he didn't have to. He said the exact opposite. Follow me. You'll be okay because he knew he was following the word of God. Teach the word of God with authority and then put an exclamation mark behind that teaching by your actions, by behaving accordingly. And we all fail. So confess and be honest when you fail, sure. But don't, don't do what he did, that pastor I was talking about. That wasn't just confessing when you failed. That was looking for adoration. That was, that was promoting a false sense of, of uh, humility. And he didn't repent. He just continued to do it. Well, anyway, Christian leader has to live the Bible or he's not a leader. And a Bible teacher better live the Bible or he's not teaching right. He's not going to be able to teach the Bible effectively. I can tell you that. Verse 18, nobody likes a hypocrite. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now I tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Those who say that the cross of Christ did not sufficiently pay for our sins are enemies of the cross of Christ. You are degrading the value 
of that cross upon which the Son of God suffered and died and shed his blood. You say that it wasn't sufficient to pay for our sins. You are an enemy of the cross of Christ. Those who say that we must add our own good works to obtain redemption and salvation, which Jesus already purchased for us on the cross, are enemies of the cross of Christ. Christians who insist on being self-centered instead of Christ-centered or others-centered are also enemies of the cross of Christ because the cross means the cross means dying to self and living for God and doing what is needful for others. And those who refuse to die to self, as Jesus said, and pick up their cross and carry it daily, but instead live for themselves, are living as enemies of the cross of Christ. You're not following the cross. You're not following Jesus' example. You don't appreciate the cross. You don't believe in its sufficiency. And you don't self-sacrifice for the sake of Almighty God and Jesus Christ and follow his example. You are an enemy of the cross of Christ by your actions and your words. And so he says... In 18, let's read 18 and 19 together. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul had such a love for Jesus that when he thought about how people were undermining the finished work of Christ on the cross, it made him cry. Because he knew how much Jesus suffered. It was horrible. He lived in the midst of crucifixion. Rome crucified many, many criminals, many, many people. So everybody knew how horrible it was. It was so horrible that you could not be crucified if you were a Roman citizen. It was just unspeakably hideous. And he knew that Jesus never sinned and that he went through all that for us to pay for our sins. And so when he saw people disregarding it as if it was unimportant or not sufficient, in and of itself, it made him weep because he knew, at least in those cases, Jesus died for those people for nothing. His greatest desire is to save every soul from hell. And they rejected it. And they are rejecting it, and many are rejecting it today. So he says, for many of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. You better pay close attention to this verse. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to what God is saying in this verse. Don't brush over it. Don't ignore it. And if your preacher doesn't talk about it, or this, this circumstance, if your preacher doesn't talk about this verse, if your preacher doesn't talk about this subject, then I would ask you, why are you supporting him? And you better talk to him and tell him that he's dropping the ball in this area. Because what God is saying here in verse 19, let me read it again. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things, listen to this, a faith that saves is a faith that changes how you live. A faith that saves a faith in Jesus Christ that is genuine and salvation, saving faith, is a faith that will change you more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. It will make you holy. I don't want to hear that lie that is promoted in so many places today in so-called modern Evangelical Christianity. I don't want to hear that lie about carnal so-called Christians who live like the devil 
and expect to be in heaven. That is a lie. It is not true. You cannot back that with scripture. Just the opposite. If, now watch this verse, if their appetites are their gods and their mind is set on earthly things, then God says right here in black and white, plain English, their end is destruction. They're not saved. They're not saved. If you live for your appetites instead of the Word of God, if you don't care about Jesus Christ, if your mind is set on earthly things instead of on heavenly things, then your end is destruction. That means you're not saved. You say, well, I think they're just a carnal Christian. You Just stop saying that. You can't find that. Well, I know Christians can fall into sin. We all do. And when we are sinning, we are a carnal Christian. But to remain in that state is not biblical. I'm saying you can't be a Christian and keep doing that because First John says that the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you won't allow you to do that. He is holy. And you cannot remain in sin. A carnal Christian is somebody who sins. The Corinthians, in many ways, were carnal. That's because they committed sin. Fine, get it. But there isn't a whole secondary level of Christians called carnal Christians. No. If you live that as a lifestyle, if that's your settled state of mind, like he's explaining here in verse 19, you're simply not saved. Your end is destruction. Anytime you slip into sin as a Christian, you are a carnal Christian at that moment. But if it's a lifestyle, you're not saved. See, that's the lie that's being promoted today. Jesus said, don't fear those who can only destroy the body. Fear him who has power to destroy both body and soul in hell. And Jesus warned about the broad road that leads to hell. So if your mind is set on earthly things instead of on Jesus Christ, you're in trouble. If your mind is set on these things, you are in trouble. And if you think you're saved, you're not. Well, you can take care of that right now. Just fall on your knees. Repent of your sin and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior. I'm not talking about salvation by works. I'm talking about salvation by faith. I've already talked about the sufficiency of the cross of Christ apart from good works. I'll die for that truth. But if you're trusting in Christ, if you've received him as Lord and Savior, therefore the Holy Spirit is inside of you, you're not going to live like the devil. Your mind is not going to be set on earthly things. Doesn't mean you won't slip into it. It just simply means that's not where your heart is. Verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is heaven. True Christians are citizens of heaven. That's why, if we're saved, we live with eternity in mind. We are citizens of heaven. If we are saved, and therefore the Holy Spirit lives in us, we live with holiness in mind, pleasing our king in mind. If I'm an American citizen, which I am, and I'm living in another country, and a war breaks out between America and that country that I happen to be living in, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull for the United States to win. Because I'm an American citizen. That's where my heart is. I may be living in a foreign country. And there's a soccer game going on between the United States and that country that I'm living in. I'm going to pull for, the, for, the, for America to win that soccer game. Because that's where my loyalties are. And we Christians are on earth. It's true. 
but we are still citizens of heaven, and that's why we pull for God, not for the devil. That's why we want God to win, not the devil to win. That's why we pull for God, not for the world, when it sets itself up against God. That's why we cheer the Word of God. That's why we cheer preachers who proclaim the pure Word of God, because our hearts are with God. We're citizens of heaven. Christians who call themselves Christians, but live for the world and are enamored with the world, they have their hearts set on, on, on the world. And their end is destruction. They're not saved. They're not saved. Any Christian who isn't going full blast for the Lord Jesus Christ is either not a real Christian or maybe has lost sight of what Jesus has done for them because they have been inundated and, and saturated themselves with all kinds of carnal things. I don't know. I don't know. But I do know this. If you lose sight of what Jesus has done for you, how he paid for your sins, how he saved you from hell, and how he's going to rebuild those body, that body of yours and turn it into something that you're going to be able to enjoy on the new earth, which he will also create. If you lose sight of that because you have become enamored with the world, you're either not saved or you are in for a good whooping. Because God's not going to let you go on like that. Not if you're his child. Verse 21. Again, verse 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our lowly body, that it may be fashioned like his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Isn't that a glorious thought? I, you know, my favorite, my favorite uh, teaching of the entire year is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, because I get to talk about Jesus' raised body, and I get to talk about how the Bible says ours is going to be like his. And that's what he's talking about. He's going to rebuild our bodies. He's going to rebuild them. He's going to raise them. And he's going to turn them into something that will truly be a blessing and never a problem. Never a problem. Again, verse, verse 21. Who shall change our lowly body that it may be fashioned like his glorious body. I like this. According to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. You know, Jesus is God. And that's who he's talking about here. The Bible's talking about Jesus. Jesus is God. So Jesus, the Bible teaches here, will bring everything under his control. Okay? Following me so far? Jesus is God. And since he is God, he will bring everything under his control. Eventually. And since he is 100% good, that means when he has total control of everything and sin has run its course, everything is going to be 100% good. The world will be 100% good. The environment will be 100% good. Your, your lifestyle will be 100% good. Your ability to taste will be 100% good. Your ability to hear, to walk, to talk, to touch, Everything will be 100% good. Your ability to worship Jesus without any distractions will be 100%. Everything is going to be 100% good because he's going to bring everything under his control and he's 100% good. And it also means something for today. If you want to be a good Christian, and you do if you're a Christian, then let Jesus have complete control of you. Offer the members of your body as a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1. Let Jesus have control of you because you can't be bad when Jesus is allowed to control your thoughts, your words, and your actions because he's 100% good. Now let's go on to chapter 4 just a little bit. We'll get our foot in the door just barely. Therefore, my brethren, 
dearly beloved and long for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Paul didn't trust Paul didn't Paul didn't trust a lot of Christians because they didn't have a heart for God like he did, him and Timothy, but he trusted these guys. They truly loved Paul. They were good. They were really good. But it says here in verse 1, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Notice the, the love language that Paul uses as he teaches these Christians in Philippi. He didn't try to twist anyone's arm to get them to live for Jesus. He didn't, he didn't use strong arm tactics. And he didn't come up with a list of so-called holiness rules either. He, he just, well, look at verse 2. I beseech Judea and I beseech Syntyche. I beg you guys, I beg you ladies, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, he said in verse 1, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. He's appealing to them on the basis of grace, not on the basis of law. And he says, stand firm in Jesus. Don't let the world pull you away from Christ. Don't latch on to the first shiny object that comes along that will entice you away from righteousness because that shiny object, guaranteed, has a hook in it and it'll destroy you. So stand firm against the enticements of sin. And I know it's hard at times. It's hard at times. Temptation is a tough thing. That's what makes it temptation. It takes real effort at time to stand firm for Jesus Christ. But use some spiritual elbow grease and stand firm for holiness, and you'll be glad you did, and so will Christ. And that goes for the two ladies spoken of in verse 2. It's going to take effort. It's going to take a real love for Jesus. But it's worth it. Because you'll be happy, but more than anything, you'll please Jesus. He says, I beseech Judea and I beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Have the mind of Christ. Have the attitude of Christ and get along. And that's what's going to happen, by the way. Once One mark of a Christian who is in the flesh instead of in the spirit is bickering. When Christians aren't getting along, either one or both are not controlled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gets along just fine with himself. The Holy Spirit gets along just fine with himself. So if two people are under the control of the Holy Spirit, they're going to be getting along with each other. Not a problem. There won't be any problem. There's not going to be any strife there. But all it takes is one person in the flesh to cause trouble. And there will be trouble. There will be trouble. Because the Christian involved who is under the control of the Holy Spirit is going to oppose the one who is in the flesh. They have to. They have to. You can't let it ride. When somebody's doing something wrong, promoting something wrong, saying something wrong, you can't let that ride if you're walking in the Spirit. you got to say something. Sin cannot be tolerated. Heresy cannot be tolerated. It cannot be allowed to prosper just so people can get along for the sake of peace. The Bible says, as much as is possible, as much as is possible, live at peace with one another. But sometimes peace is not possible. Peace at any price is not biblical. Peace at the price of tolerating sin or false teaching is turning peace into an idol. And Jesus never did that. And Paul never did that. And nobody who's walking in the Spirit ever did that. you got to stop. Out of time. You can continue studying the Word of God at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out. If you're hungry for the Word of God, that's a place to go. Because you can study it until, you, until your eyes can't see anymore. Until your eyes are blurry and you fall asleep. Just click on the book you want to study. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Click on the book you want to study. Click on the chapter. Bring your Bible. Make sure you bring your Bible. Open it up. Follow along and listen as I teach it verse by verse. Begin. If you haven't already, I can't encourage you strongly enough 
to begin a verse-by-verse -verse study through the entire Bible from Genesis through Revelation. Or you can study whatever book you want to study. That's up to you. The important thing is getting the Word, okay? And if the Word of God is a blessing to you, please consider standing shoulder to shoulder with me, being a partner in this ministry and helping me to get out the Word of God because I don't get help from anybody else. This has been a faith ministry for 30 years. I don't receive a salary, a regular salary, never have. I just teach the Word of God straight. I don't get receive help from a denomination or from any church or anything. I depend on individuals who love God's Word and want to be a part of this ministry and help me to get out the Word of God. And you can. Just click the Donate button at the top of the front page and give prayerfully as the Lord may lead. But also pray for this ministry, would you please? I need your prayer so badly. And you can send along your questions, your comments. Write me, email me. Send along your questions, your comments, whatever, prayer request, and I promise I will read it and respond to it. Again, the address is thebibleversebyverse.com. That's thebibleversebyverse.com. Thank you for spending this time with me. We'll conclude the book of Philippians next time. Until then, so long, everyone.